So there's the one. Holly, hold it up. Working on it. I'm taking out the plastic. It's nice. I like that we got representation on both of the expansions. Yeah, it was not planned at all, actually. It literally, I came home and it was just on my stoop. So the two expansions, <laughs> oh. uh, Troublemakers and Companions with the base game. Yeah, that's uh, a nice start. Mm. Very nice. You got the boy colored one. I got the girly colored one. I'm actually jealous. <laughs> I want that one because of all the Marvel references that are on the cover. Yes, <laughs> I like it. It has all the little purple shards and the, I like the colors of this. It pops out a little bit more from what I've seen so far. Let's see. Yeah, the Companions has definitely got a more thematic uh, touch to it, yeah. whereas the Troublemakers has a stronger mechanics touch, I think. Agreed. Can you do that okay? Is that a good camera angle? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. See the new player All boards there? Shards. Yeah, the dial boards look good. <clears throat> Some counters. This oh, that's, the, the that's the one for Mike there, right? Yep. We've actually yeah. updated that board. It's got the friendship on it now. Yep, that is the old sound. Oh, there's lots of these. What are these going to do? These dial boards? We might get so into what, it later when we talk about the yeah. Yeah. You're going to take a companion card and a shard card and um, pair them up in a pairing. Yeah, and the, the Kickstarter right now, uh, there's how to play videos for both of those. So, yeah. Not going to lie, I absolutely loved those videos when I was looking at an instructionless expansion. <laughs> the fact that the rule books are up on the Kickstarter also helped. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were, so, oh, aren't the, yeah, the rules are on there, yeah. PDFs. Yep, yep. Right. Yeah, uh, we have PDFs for you uh, guys if you want to look at them too, but they're, they're available on the Kickstarter as well. So Holly, who's unboxing the Companions expansion, is one of our social media emissaries. Oh, oh no, she just oh she she was frozen for a second. The so thank you for that. One. The bottom. So when I went to go open it, they all just <laughs> fell to the floor. Perfect. <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Uh, I just have to get them before the dogs get them. No. <laughs> Troubles are after them. I made my own trouble. <laughs> and our, our awesome, kind host, Michael. Uh, uh, oh, man, I'm going to say your last name wrong again. Jul yep. Jul Juliana. Juliana. Juliana, yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. You got me started. So, so you don't say the second G. Correct. It's a it's a J sound instead of the G, and then the second G is silent. Cool. Also, yeah. a social media emissary for the campaign that is live, as well as Red, who is is um, here on the call. Yes. Cool, Very cool, cool. appreciated. You're full of emissaries. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, you know, because being as excited as I was for the expansions, I, you know, as soon as I got it, I set up a play session so that I could get that stuff in. And as soon as the Kickstarter launched today, I got the notification, backed it myself, and then made my posts. Awesome. Yeah. Very much appreciated. It is easy to get behind good stuff. And this is good stuff. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> look at all these cards. <laughs> You. Oh. <laughs> so honestly, uh, the bump mechanic of asking for troubles um, definitely makes it a lot easier for newer players, um, as opposed to being kind of locked into a place. Um, that was one of the features that really sold me on it as probably my personal favorite worker placement game. Yeah, we... Uh that was a big part of uh, trying to lower frustrations in worker placement. I mean, we're big fans of, uh, when I say we, I mean me and Aaron, the other designer, uh, we're big fans of worker placement, but that's the one little part, any worker placement you play where you get blocked, everybody feels that frustration of, you know, I was planning on going here, then here, then here, that was my plan, and now it's ruined, and I got to figure out a way. And 
that could be fun too. That's why we enjoy worker placements. But we thought if we're going to create something that's going to be uh, entryway into gaming or, uh, or at least a very frustration free kind of game, we were going to do that bumping mechanic. So we were really happy with how that turned out. Hey, that adds such a level of strategy though, because when you decide or when you're starting to decide if I want to bump your plane or your ship off the location, that's a wicked decision because do I want to give you another choice? So normal worker placements, you're like, oh, I can't go there. I got to figure out something else. This game gives you that, well, I can go anywhere I want, but do I want to give people that extra action this turn? Mm -hmm. And it's such an interesting, pivotal moment in most games that I've played. Right. And it's also an interesting, uh, we were trying to figure out what is the interaction people have with other people because we didn't want to create a solitaire kind of game. And uh, the fun part about this is usually whenever you say, oh, it's interactive, that means the other person is thwarting you or doing something to mess you up. In this case, every time someone interacts with you in this game, it's actually beneficial to you. Um, and in a way, you know, uh, it, it's a family weight game. And uh, we initially wanted it to be, um, you know, young adult and up kind of thing. Um, but people who've gotten their kids playing and stuff like that, they can also turn that a little bit to be like, you know, this is the first time they're ever playing a game, so I'll bump them, you know. Give them a, so you get to change the level of competitiveness in the game yourself just by deciding where to go. Such a wicked option. Much more have this instead of take that. Yeah, exactly. And that, that ties really well into, um, Steve had to leave us, but he put in the chat the comment, uh, sounds great. My group has learned to aim for the low cost, parentheses, no traps, troubles as the most efficient path to victory. New viable strategies will be very welcome, uh, as will the new humorous sci-fi references, of course. <laughs> so that, that point about... Um, the low cost traps and actually usually it's kind of inefficient to go for in worker placement games to go for the cheap easy points but because asking for troubles is an efficiency game um a little bit more than a resource conversion game there is some resource conversion but it's much more of an efficiency game mm -hmm. snagging those cheap points at the right moments can can totally win you the game and that's what i love about that that um, that play there yeah and there's also a way around that I, whenever i play uh and i want to really win uh because sometimes you play and you just want to relax and have fun but uh sometimes i'll uh gear up because you know how you can customize your board to you can customize your ship so that you can get different stuff i'll gear it in a way to where i can get traps very easily and or very easily and i'll grab up mega traps and stuff like that before those even hit so whenever they come up, I grab those up real easily and people don't even have time to gear up for those. So there's another way around it, but you have to kind of prepare for it. Yeah. You mentioned I I one of the coolest the, parts uh, of the game. Gain as many workers as I can strategy over uh, starting off with resources. Uh, I find that in any worker placement game, regardless of you know the bump mechanic, having more workers means that you'll very quickly be able to start ramping uh, yes and no. If I'm playing a right. seven-player game, you'll find me sometimes lagging behind in that because with seven players, especially if they're getting more ships, you'll tend to get bumped almost as often as if you have two or three. Mm -hmm. um, but some after a while, like I, I did that for a while, and then my game group started catching on, and then they were like, <laughs> "No, you got to get ships too. We're we're not going to bump you." I was like, "All right, fine." Uh, so that's true. And uh, you were saying some about uh, the connections, Michael? Yeah, so you touched upon, um, uh, we're kind of already into uh, the gameplay, um, but you touched upon one of my favorite uh, bits of the game was the ability to upgrade your ship. Um, and one of the things I wanted to talk about for those that don't understand or haven't been able to play um, Asking for Troubles, um, the game is, re it, it's, it's, uh, Chris, why don't you talk about it? <laughs> well, I was 
kind of hoping you would there. I was, <laughs> I was like, oh, I good, I get to relax you. while someone else explains. Uh, no, that's fine. I'll tell you. Um, in fact, I can show. I have it right here in front of me. So uh, everybody's going to have, you can hear me over that. Everybody's going to have their own ship card. And uh, this is, you know, a uh, thematic ship that you have along with the plastic bits that come with it. Um, but you can go to the space station and you can buy connection. So for instance, on the board, when you go to planet Palmy here, uh, let me see if I can get there. Yeah, planet Palmy there, you get two carrots. But if you were to buy another carrot connection and put it on your board, now you get three carrots. Uh, and it doesn't have to be all carrots. You know, you can you can put ore there and now you get two carrots and an ore. And then if you buy another one, you can stack it. And now you get four things, you know, three carrots and an ore. Um, so you get to customize what you do at that location. Um, and that, that goes back to the bumping too, because if I see somebody has three connections at a space, I think, okay, I'm going to go to that space because I know they're going over there to, and they're going to bump me and give me back my ship. You know? So there's all those little fun strategies behind that kind of thing. It is one of the coolest mechanics of the game. The bumping is definitely helpful. It's great for beginners. It's great for strategists. But that, the ability to upgrade your ship really, it just makes the game sing, really. You're, you're customizing this tableau in a sense, but it's, it's your ship and it's your ship. And you really feel like your ship can do amazing things across this universe. Yeah. I, well, and then you have the uh, connection upgrades through the new expansion too. So you can customize it even further. Right. Right. Uh, that's the Troublemakers expansion that Michael has there. Uh, yeah, whenever you go uh, to the Sagan colony and turn in Trobots, you can upgrade those connections to give you double basically what they do. And you can really ramp up some stuff then. And at some point, Michael can show off uh, those Troublemaker uh, components too, like uh, Holly did with the companions for sure. Sure can. Whenever Michael wants to. <clears throat> well, let's take it back a little bit. Uh, we're sitting here cool. talking with uh, Chris Strain, um, designer, co designer of Asking for Troubles, um, which came out in 2015, uh, a new iteration in 2017 by Breaking Games. And now we're back with uh, two expansions. Uh, Holly was showing off Companions. Um, I will start showing off uh, Troublemakers. Um, so, Chris, uh, Kraken Games, where did that come from? So, Kraken Games is uh, Aaron and I, uh, we wanted to design games together. Um, so, we started Kraken Games. We made our first game called uh, Evil Intent, which uh, eventually... Uh, uh, made it on uh, Kickstarter. Uh, um, and we made a small run of that and learned a lot from that experience. Um, and strangely enough, it's, it's almost the antithesis of Troubles where it's a very take that kind of game, very be evil mm -hmm. to people kind of thing. Um, and we realized after playing that game a thousand times, which is what you do when you design a game, um, we realized that we didn't really like take that mechanics that much. So we kind of went hardcore turn the other way um, and wanted a low frustration kind of fun uh, laid back uh, kind of game. And that's kind of the beginnings of Troubles. Um, actually, the very beginning of Troubles was I just shouted out at her one time, hey, I wonder if we could design a game that's all orange. And then she said, okay, but we should make it worker placement because I want to design a worker placement. And I said, okay, that's awesome. I hope I want to make it space because I like space. And that's literally the beginning of Troubles. <laughs> that's how that, that, and then we just based everything off of that. Um, Fantastic. And so Kraken Games, uh, the problem with uh, being an, the artist, graphic designer, uh, campaign manager, uh, designer, game designer, everything, for a game is that if you want to make games, you end up making one every three years because <laughs> you're, you're doing all of that. So 
what we realized is after we made Troubles as Kraken Games, uh, we didn't want to take three years to make a game. And so we reached out to Breaking Games uh, to see if they could uh, not only take asking Troubles to the next level, but uh, really, you know, do the things we couldn't, like reach new markets and everything like that, um, which they did. Um, and they're also helping us with this Kickstarter. Uh, they're, you know, helping us get this Kickstarter launched off. We'd never be able to uh, get all this stuff done on our own. So, um, yeah, so Breaking Games just uh, gave us the tools to be able to get this stuff made and done, you know, and any, I guess the problem is I just want to do everything myself when it comes to, comes to troubles, but I've learned from that lesson and uh, can't do it all by yourself. You need a team of people, you know? Uh, I need Mike here to answer questions <laughs> and help us out with uh, the community. And, uh, and, uh, and you need everybody else uh, basically in breaking games to help with all the stuff that I'm not that great at. Team. Yes. Definitely team. takes a team. Yes. Well, with the industry, uh, somewhere is around 3,000 games being published. Hmm. Um, you got to find the right people that are going to help you not only make a good component uh, for a good or great game, but you have to find the team that's going to bring that above the 3,000. Because like you said, if you want to make, you had mentioned you make a game every three years. That's a good game, like a solid, I want to play it again type game. Anyone can make a game and you can crank out games throughout the year. But to make a game that's going to stand out in a, a pile of 3,000 plus games a year, you got to have a solid team behind it. Right. I mean, uh, you know, if you have a solid team behind you, it doesn't have to take three years. And, um, you know, if you're trying to do it all by yourself, uh, which is what I was trying to do, uh, well, not the game design. I mean, Aaron, uh, Aaron, especially for the expansions, was chief designer on those. Um, but, uh, you know, eventually you just have to say I, I want to make more than one game every three years so. but you're right about the the crowd too when we started doing this in 2012 um you know i think Viticulture culture just come out on kickstarter was where we were uh and you know things were a lot easier to make a kickstarter and put it out there and instantly be seen so uh, now that it's so crowded that uh yeah you you need a team behind that honestly So, uh, Asking for Troubles originally Kickstarter uh, 2015. Um, Breaking Games comes in 2017, gives it a facelift. Um, now we're 2020 with two expansions, um, which we'll show off. I have the Troublemakers. Uh, Holly had the, the uh, Companions. What can, what can backers expect from the expansions? I know we kind of talked about a little bit of, of what they do. Um, what can they expect to, if they own the game, uh, what can they do to the game? Um, and just basically what can they expect from the expansions? So, uh, like I was saying earlier, uh, Troublemakers, uh, brings a more, uh, mechanism, uh, kind of feel to the game, uh, at least a heavier mechanics feel where, uh, not only are you getting points from Troubles now, but you're getting points from capturing Trobots as well. It's a different... Uh, it's a, I don't want to say a different path. Yeah, those are the Trobots. Uh, basically, a uh, scientist on Sagan Colony wanted to help with the trouble situation. And so they created robots, which, of course, in sci fi, uh, always go haywire. And they're almost as bad as Trobots now. So you, as a trouble hunter, are going to go around hunting these as well. Um, and, and you could collect points for those and upgrade your connections. Um, so uh, what that does, though, is that instead of creating two different paths for points, you can kind of collect points along the same path, if that makes sense. Um, like if you're going to a place to get resources to grab troubles, which are points, um, that place might also have trobots, and you can grab them along the way and then go to the other spot to get points. So, um, you know, there's already kind of a, when you start the game, it's like, do I go for more ships? Do I go for upgrading my ship? Do I grab those easy troubles off the bat? 
Um, and so now there's another decision of, do I start gearing up to go for Trobots? Yeah. You have these sweet location cards as well? Yes, yeah, uh, thanks for bringing those. Uh, uh, that's another thing I wanted to do with the uh, expansion was explore the different places. Like um, you should have, yeah, some of those have missing art and then, uh, which I'm currently working on. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and then uh, some of them, like if you find the, uh, can you find like the Planet Palmy bunny one in there? And I think you might also have the slug one or well, I'm trying to remember if that got updated or not, but um, definitely the, the bunnies from Planet Palmy are in there. And basically I wanted to give a flavor of what each location looked like when you're there. Um, and during the campaign, I'm gonna be uh, putting photos and videos of the new art being made and stuff like that. So uh, you can see what Smash Rock looks like. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's what Planet Palmy looks like. Say something, Mike, so you come up there. Oh, yeah. I guess you can't see it unless <laughs> I talk, huh? Speaker me. <laughs> That's good, because then I can cover up my face, and you don't look at me, and you just look at the card. Okay. Yeah, so there are a few cards in there for Planet Palmy, and you can see that there are little bunny creatures that live there. Uh, in fact, uh, we kind of... Yep. I like that one. Well, there's another one. So, uh, in fact, we even kind of uh, cross uh, themed that, and one of the companions you can get is one of those bunnies. Like this oh, little good. bunny right oh, look here. At that. It's look like at that. <laughs> Ta da. That's teamwork. All time, Holly. <laughs> teamwork <laughs> makes the dream work. It's <laughs> awesome. So, um, yeah, so Troublemakers is a way to explore those different locations as well. So we did want we didn't want to uh, lack some theme there. <laughs> yeah, the art is fantastic too. I mean, I know most of this is final art. A lot of it, these white cards will be filled in, but the art that's here, it it and the art from the base game is just stellar. It's it's so cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I like this one. Can you see him? Yes. Little Sheldon. Little Sheldon. <laughs> so the companions, which uh, uh, Game Goddess has there. Um, I do. Yes. Uh, that one uh, carried a lot more theme with it, obviously, because you have all these different characters to play with um, and a lot of uh, goofy things that they say that if you know where they're from, you know, you'll enjoy that. And if not, uh, they still function you know, you don't have to know where they're coming from, but um, these guys have little quirks that you have to put up with, but if you put up with them, they will give you uh, shards, those little purple, uh, I think I actually had them over here. Oh yeah, there you go. Yes. So those are shards, a new resource, and you can use those to get the new trouble cards that the game comes with as well, the expansion comes with. Um, you can still get the troubles. Yes. So you can still get the troubles with resources. Those are the happy cities that they come with. Those have been slightly updated as well. Um, so you can get the. Yeah. <laughs> so you can get the troubles uh, with uh, shards or with um, resources, or sometimes you can uh, choose between the two. Uh, here's an example. This one has either or. That the line means either or. Yes. So you could either pay those resources or you can get them uh, with the shards. So the expansions so, are bringing in a brand new resource. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, the one expansion anyway. Right. The companions expansion. Yeah. So Only the previous expansion the... that's purple. <laughs> mm -hmm. So those that like purple will like this game. As I do. You do. Yeah, we kind of wanted to go with a, because, uh, you know, obviously the main game is heavy orange. Uh, we didn't want to get rid of the orange, but we kind of wanted to lean towards other colors so that when you put the rings around the board, you know, you, you get a little bit of a different feel. So the, uh, the Troublemakers has a green feel. The uh, Companions has that uh, pinkish purple feel. So I remember, are the uh, expansions designed to be used together? 
So they are not designed to be used together, but they are designed so that they could be used together. Um, however, uh, because the game goes up to seven players, we test played it with both at seven players and it was too long. Um, but, and we had some new players too, but, um, but, you know, if you're playing two, three players and you want to give it a try, we're not going to say, don't do it. It will work. Uh, it might make it a little longer. So that just a little warning there. <laughs> uh, I personally, I think it's better whenever you play them one or the other, it's like a flavor, like what flavor do you want to play with it? But, you know, I'm not going to tell people that you can't do it because it does function. We we did test it and it does function that way. Good to know. I remember uh, back when it was first on Kickstarter, uh, one of my draws was the orange and blue being from Syracuse. Um, it really stood out like, oh, I need to own this just for that. <laughs> and then it's been a staple, not only when I go to my game nights, um, but any chance I get to bring it out to someone who understands games but wants to experience something that's just fun. It's just a fun game. The theme, the, the, oh, the, the, the comments, um, the art, I, everything about the game. <laughs> they have to experience it. Like they're getting excited over there too. <laughs> Sorry, that's the puppies. I was just about to put myself on mute. <laughs> Those little troubles. Yeah, little they troubles. Are, they are little troublemakers. <laughs> I only have three left out of the seven, though, so they're, they're slowly dwindling. Aww. So um, the Kickstarter, we're, we're recording this uh, the launch day. Uh, just started October 27th. It runs till November 19th. Um, you can find it on Breaking Games website. You can find it on Kickstarter. Um, where else should they look for it? Uh, so, yeah, the Kickstarter. Um, you mean the link for the Kickstarter? Sorry. Yeah, if they're looking to find yeah. this, more information about this. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to uh, not get away from it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, because we try our best to talk about it, and it, you'll you'll spend you know all this money and all this time just constantly talking about it, and there'll always be somebody like, oh, I never saw this. Um, that's just how Kickstarter goes, right? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you should see it on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, Mike, uh, Discord in there as well. Um, yeah, the uh, anyone, yeah, definitely, if you are on Discord, there's a really fun, uh, we have a channel on the Kickstarter Games Discord server, which is a really fun server. It's like they have a challenge of having to retire channels because of the 500 channel limit on Discord. Wow. <laughs> so they actually track a lot. It's a really great community if you want to talk about Kickstarter games. And so we're there with, you know, a, a variety of titles as well as asking for troubles. But yeah, that's a good spot. Um, but we're on, on Board Game, Board Game Geek. Um, we have posts in the forums. Um, as well as Facebook, and now we get are getting people to share on Twitter. That's the current social media goal, right? Unless we've already met that, um, and we're moving on. I should check. Let's that see. social media sharing goal is a really fun way to get people to quote unquote unlock some new companion cards. Um, so that you see the, the the whole deck of cards that Holly already has, Game Goddess already has on um, there they're going to add even more to that. Um, one of those companions is lurking uh, on uh, Michael's screen there. <laughs> well, one of them, yeah, one of them has already been unlocked, the baby. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, it's not in here, though, you're saying? It's not it, in this part? It won't be, it's not in that version, no. Not in your demo version. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go to the Kickstarter page, you'll see which one we're talking about. Yes. And how it was already unlocked really quickly. I don't know what you're pointing at. Uh, I, that is. <laughs> I had an itch. I just had an itch. Um, right, a twitch thing right there. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm obviously a huge sci-fi dork, and I just wanted to shove everything I love into the game. So, I I, I apologize for nothing. <laughs> I learned a new uh, a new thing today. I was I, one of the questions uh, that I wanted to ask Chris was why there were in the original game there are cards that reference uh, a certain uh, sci-fi movie 
um, that happened in a galaxy far away that both Chris and I are, are, are extreme fans of. Um, but one of my concerns was that a ship wasn't represented. There you go. Um, a ship wasn't represented from that franchise, but two ships were basically represented from another sci-fi franchise. And Chris uh, showed me that there was uh, indeed a ship from the franchise I adore. Um, yeah, just a little squished down version. Um, but some of you might recognize that um, as a certain Mandalorian ship. We call it the Master. Hard to see it. There may or may not be some riffraff cards that also <laughs> reference uh, that particular franchise. Can you? Oh put yeah, there there are three of them that thing. I know of. What was that, Holly? Can you put this shit back? I couldn't see Wait. it fast. I don't have my glasses on. Yeah, it's blurry too. I don't know if my camera will focus on it, but oh, I see it. Yeah, that one's called the Master. Got undertones of like a neutral green with like a burgundy. Nope, it's all orange. It's orange. All, all orange. I saw somebody actually paint these and I said, that's <laughs> great and everything, but needs more orange. <laughs> Don't take my orange away. What's really amusing is that there were uh, clear promo ships that they uh, had for a little while. Right. Yeah, the clear ones, I guess I can forgive that because, you know, they're not orange. <laughs> yeah we gave the clear um, uh clear ships away to we had drawings to give those away before the campaign and we may try to give more of those away during the campaign i have to see what we have left cool so pay attention to the campaign help us unlock more cool stuff for the expansions uh, with those social media goals on whatever's up next uh, while you're watching this, be it Facebook or Twitter or uh, any of the socials. Um, cool. Yeah, we got a question on comments and I'll, I'll answer it on the comments uh, page, uh, but uh, just the answer is they're, they're saying, oh, no stretch goals, uh, just sharing goals. Um, yeah, you, you always have that question of you're gonna do uh, stretch goals and sharing goals and all that stuff. Um, I think in the end, we just decided that we already knew all the stuff we really wanted into it. Um, and we kind of wanted to just put our best foot forward. The, the last Kickstarter we did for Troubles, we didn't get to the stretch goal of plastic ships till like the last two days. And then once that hit, everybody was like, oh, wow, plastic ships and started piling in. But then we realized, you know, we should have started day one with all those ships. So uh, in this case, uh, we want to do share the goals, get people interested, excited, and add new companions. We got, we have a lot of them planned and stuff like that, but we wanted to basically put all our best foot forward there, so. Legitimately, I'm always a big fan of not doing stretch goals, of having just all of the content available in the campaign. I, um, I I've heard both events, I mean, both uh, sides of it, and I see both sides of it. And in some cases, it makes sense. In some cases, it doesn't. You know, I, I mean, we had a lot of stretch goals in uh, the Breaking Games Dwellings uh, uh, thing, and that was fun. And that was fun to unlock stuff. And, uh, you know, a bigger game like that, uh, sometimes it works out that way that uh, it makes more sense to do it. Uh, I, I never think that one campaign uh, – you know, the way one campaign is run should be run the same throughout all campaigns. It, it just depends on the game. Right. Then we followed up with uh, Rise of Tribes, Beasts, and Bronze, where we just had it all baked in, you know, expansion to the existing game and said all the good stuff is is there. Yeah. And, I, uh, I mean, that's another thing. If you're doing expansions, you're already kind of adding to a game that's already there. It, you have We already have so much to talk about that you know, adding more things to uh, an arbitrary stretch goal uh, just didn't work out for this campaign. I can see that. I mean, uh, the dwellings, uh, the dwellings campaign was huge as it was, but you know, the cost of adding those things, it makes sense to have stretch goals. Whereas, you know, right, right, and if you're going to do a stretch goal. Uh, like, for instance, if we did stretch goals for these plastic ships and we didn't make that stretch goal, 
I don't want this game without these <laughs> plastic ships, you know? And uh, I, I just didn't want to risk it. I was like, no, I, I want to make the game how we want to make it. You know, this is the game uh, day one. That's what we want to make. So. It's good. And here we are on day one. Um, do we have an update or do we not want, do we not, does that not matter right now? Oh yeah, it's climbing. It's getting there. Yeah. Um, I made. Uh, I was telling uh, Michael earlier. Um, I could have made the goal as a lot of people do. You know, uh, five thousand or uh, ten thousand and gotten there real quick because we shot up real quick. Um, but I just kind of wanted to put a realistic print goal in there so that everybody knows we know what we're doing. <laughs> we, we've been through this. We know what it costs to make stuff. You know, so. Uh, yeah, I, I will either get there tonight or tomorrow, and that's great. Again, it runs yep. till uh, November nineteenth. Yep. Um, so get out there and 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 make this game. Uh, the game's already going to be great. I mean, the social stretch goal is going to be even better, but the game's already looking fantastic. Um, kudos to you and the team to put it together. <laughs> um, good stuff as always. Um, so looking ahead. And uh, this is being recorded, but what can, is, is there a, a, a tale for uh, trouble? Is there more to come? Um, I mean, there are ideas. Um, so we got in a, not, not trouble, but uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I always catch myself when I say stuff like that. Um, when we did the very first 2015 Kickstarter, we already had ideas for these expansions. Uh, and some of them, uh, we had a lot of ideas. Some of them made it, and these are the ones that came through the, uh, the furnace, the crucible. Um, but we didn't realize how long it would take to get to uh, expansions we would enjoy having with the game. Uh, mainly because the game is so tight and works so well uh, already that it was hard to make something that really benefited the gameplay. Um, so... We do have ideas of things that we could do and move forward, but I'm not going to promise anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not going to say, yeah, we have this coming or anything like that. Cause honestly, I can't tell you how long it's going to take <laughs> to get to that. Sure. But it's good to know that the game is supported and it's not like this is it. No, that would and, be sad if this was it. And the whole world of the orange system and stuff like that. Um, I mean, we have, almost never ending ideas of what could be done here. So, and, and maybe some ideas that might be announced throughout the campaign or a little later, so. Ooh, good to know. But you can't get me um, in trouble, so I, I can't say anything. No, yeah, I, I don't want to get you in trouble. I want you to stick around. Um, speaking of sticking around, um, I'd like to shift gears into not only you as a designer, but your thoughts on some stuff uh, that's happening around us, like the virtual conventions, the state of, of conventions, maybe uh, as soon as next year, um, stuff like that. So I don't know if uh, hard shift, you can edit this to whatever you need, or we'll oh, no. just go right into uh, what else does, where else can we find Chris? What else does Chris do uh, when he's not making trouble? When I'm not making troubles, um, I am... Uh, always working for Breaking Games. Uh, I do their Kickstarter, uh, I'm their Kickstarter guy. Uh, so this worked out for me. <laughs> um, uh, I also do all their, uh, not all of them, but most of their uh, videos, uh, 3D work, um, graphic design. Uh, I do some graphic design. We have a team of graphic designers actually. Um, some of the art, uh, although I don't usually handle the artwork for uh, most of the games. Um, but yeah, I mean, I fill in wherever needed, uh, at breaking games, uh, they, I've been working with them. I think, uh, I want to say beginning of 2017, 2016, uh, pretty much right whenever they grabbed trouble. So it, it was a good partnership from the beginning. Nice. Um, and, uh, I've done some side work on other things as well. I've worked with gray Fox games. Uh, I've worked with, uh, 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 cosmic wombat games and 
you know, I've done some other stuff, I, but uh, for the most part, um, uh, not the most part, but full time, I'm working with breaking games. And is there anything that's uh, in the pipeline for breaking games that we should know about? Oh, I have not been given any <laughs> go ahead to say anything about breaking games. In fact, Mike's the, Mike's the one that's <laughs> Mike's more likely to spill beans about that than I am, but I, I can't say anything. on you, Mike. You want to spill anything? Uh, I was distracted for a bit there. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what are we spilling beans on? That's one of the uh, reasons why I threw it at you. <laughs> yeah, anything like, you want to tell us that you shouldn't, really. Oh, they're hoping, um, they're hoping, yeah, the they're hoping for some dirt some, on breaking gates. So, some uh, what do we got coming down the pipeline? And I will tell you that one of our co workers, um, in recent meetings has shown us a plastic mold for the base of a game part that he's made at home, um, which is it is such a fun concept. Um, it's going to be really fun. Uh, there is a BGG paid already for Meeple Rabbids. Yes. And um, it is just uh, an awesome concept where the main featured uh, component of the game is this giant Meeple shaped mountain. And it is, you drop the Meeples into the top and they come rolling out. And it's um, then you, the way those Meeples land is. Um, the type of worker that they are. So you, you will have belly floppers, you will have standers, you will have, um, I forget what the names of them are, but um, they will you allow you to- Is uh, it It is meeple rapids. Yeah. Oh, I thought you said rabbits, like bunnies. No, <laughs> rapids as in river, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Finding it. Sorry. Think of, think of like a raft ride at a water park. This is a water water Sorry. park uh, amusement yeah. park theme thing. You and, reminded me, uh, Mike. I'm supposed to be doing the 3D portion of that slide. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm get to that soon. Uh, and we were going to go direct to retail, but I think we are course correcting, and it, we haven't locked in, but we might be going to Kickstarter with Eagle Rapids as well. We'll see. That might be soon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see it. The art is cute. Yes, it, it the art is. One of uh, I think that's all Marshall, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure now we'll put like a little image of whatever you guys are looking Rapids. at <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, they're, they're in like a tube ride. Like they're at the amusement park. I see the slide. I see the mountain. The log ride. Yeah, it's cute. I think I can put it in the comments. I can turn my camera around. I don't know if that you can see it though. Can I show it? I'm allowed to show it. Yeah, it's on BGG. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, public uh, BGG. Put a link in the comments. That won't help people uh, watching this later. There it is. There you go. Oh, nice. Who did the art? They uh, have a little. One of our art. artists, uh, Marshall Gill, uh, is credited on um, on the, uh, the listing there. But, yeah. Nice. Something fun that just released for. Uh, uh, Halloween, and that's very thematically appropriate. Something wicked. Oh, I was just going to mention that. Yes. <laughs> something wicked, right? And something wicked is has just become available on uh, Tabletop Simulator. In fact, um, I've seen tests of it where things weren't all working yet, but um, I haven't been on there since they've got it fully functioning. But um, you can definitely play that same game that Holly's holding right now on Tabletop Simulator now as well. Very cool. I was going to mention uh, that we have a play to win uh, contest going on with our program mm -hmm. for it. For the Envoy program, yes. Oh, so the Envoy yep. program is um, on their gateway. If you sign up on their gateway for free board game demos, we're doing, I think, like 19 or 20 sessions, sessions of it this week. And um, anybody who plays gets uh, entered into a chance to win the physical copy. Nice. Like this one. Can you see it or does it reflect? Oh, awesome. I have it. A little reflection. Looking good. Look, you can see it. I should talk this it out. I'll take it out because the wrapping is like plastic, so it's kind of hard to see. But clear, I'll... yeah, clear plastic packaging so that it shows off the cauldron. Yeah, and the wands. I haven't even gotten a chance to, I made those wands. I haven't even gotten a chance to see them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just got my copy today, too. 
Um, I know I was really excited for it in part because, you know, we get to do the uh, special event, which is always fun uh, over this week, doing oh, over the next two weeks, sorry, doing uh, plays of it. So everybody gets a chance to see it. But it's a great little filler, especially if you're doing a uh, Halloween themed event. So like not this year necessarily because, you know, the state of the world. I'm going to dig out a witch hat when I do the demo. If anyone wants to video chat, I'm going to wear a hat. <laughs> Seems so like you should do that. Speaking of playing online, we also have, um, where is my copy? Ugh. You can't see my, my, my uh, prototype copy of Cafe Chaos, but that is also, Cafe Chaos is an Odd Ones Out themed game. And it is a sort of next gen of uh, Peter Vaughn's, um, one of his early games called What the Food. He ran a Kickstarter, and the What the Food campaign, similar to the Asking Troubles campaign, is what sucked Peter into working with Breaking Games. He has he has stepped away from Breaking Games now and has, has launched um, Cardboard Alchemy, uh, which is an awesome new uh, publishing game publisher that's uh, just starting out. But um, Peter is still like essentially our teammate because of. Um, Rise of Tribes, Beasts and Bronze, and Dwellings of Eldervale are, are in production and delivering. So we, we work with Peter daily still, but he's on to new things. But um, Cafe Chaos is also playable on tabletop simulator and is a food fight. Um, you're, you're putting together these food combo cards um, and it's, it's a really light game, but it has very fun decision points in terms of a little bit of hand building slash deck building um and it's just the first first player to get 10 splat points is out and then the player who has the least amount of food splattered on them is the winner i was surprised at how fun that <laughs> game was virtually yeah in fact i i find myself being surprised every time i get in a virtual uh game uh at how much i enjoy it because you you know you're always thinking oh no i want to play on the table but Ah, so found it. What a great transition that can be. Uh, one of my questions <laughs> is about virtual gaming. Um, before I forget, is Troubles on virtual at all? Um, so a fan put it, oh, Mike's got a Cafe Chaos there on the, um, so a fan put it on um, uh, Tabletopia, not Tabletopia, uh, Tabletop Simulator, Steel Simulator, and um, uh, Troubles. Troubles. So a fan put it on uh, Simulator, and um, I believe it's still there. Uh, function. I looked at it. I want to say maybe about a month ago, uh, and it's still in there. Um, uh, although the for whatever reason the 3D ships didn't translate <laughs> at the mm -hmm. time that they were doing it. I'm sure I've seen 3D in there. In fact, last night I was in the test play uh, with something else, and they had minis in there, and it looked great. So. Uh, I should go back in there and clean it up so that people can play. Um, just one of the many things I hadn't gotten to yet, unfortunately. Um, so one of like the busy. things that I realized. Yeah. <laughs> I will say um, that um, one of the reasons why I was slow on it, and again, this might just be my bias that I just spoke about uh, on it, but Troubles, one of the big things, and we haven't talked about this, but one of the big things about Troubles is that the turns are really fast. So you know, I'll go and then like there's six other people. So I think, oh, I'll pick up my phone. By the time I pick up my phone, they're saying it's my turn again. I'm like, oh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it just comes around so fast. And I'm worried that virtually you lose that. Um, you know, there, in virtual games, there's always like, oh, it's my turn because you don't get those visual cues of I'm done kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I, I'm willing to be wrong. I'm willing uh, everybody get in a tabletop simulator, go play troubles and tell me if uh feels the same well we are testing um uh letter tycoon which is another one of our titles on board game arena uh, it's not public yet um but board game arena might be a little bit better environment because it allows for those faster turns you don't have to um, manage the dexterity of you know, moving your mouse and grabbing and picking up pieces. Putting the ship that. on the spot. Yeah. Like that, yeah, that's what will slow down the play uh, when you're using a, um, a physics engine uh, environment like Tabletopia or, or 
right. tabletop simulator. I mean, as with anything, I think virtual games do well depending on the game. So, right. um, you know. But to maintain that quick play, quick turn, maybe board game arena is the better environment. But we, I don't think we have anything started there yet with um, asking for troubles. No. Chris, get on it. <laughs> I did. I did start uh, trying a Tabletopia version, but I, I got lost in trying to figure out how to program it. Um, only so much I could figure out at one point, I guess. I'm definitely so a fan of the Tabletopia uh, porting over to digital. The the scripting of it or the coding of it, I'm not familiar with at all. But I think from a designer's perspective, getting things up on Tabletopia seems a lot more user friendly than tabletop simulator but then tabletop simulator has a lot more options of coding and making sure it all works oh that's really deeper environment yeah 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 one of um, the interesting things that i realized uh was that because there's no hidden information no die rolls in uh troubles it actually translates really well to uh conferencing software such as zoom uh because one person can have the game and everybody else simply dictates out where they're going to go so instead of having some of those troubles that you see with, you know, physics engine based systems like tabletops and, and tabletopia, uh, it actually might be a little bit better to run that using web conferencing. So uh, one of the things I mentioned to Mike was actually doing a live playthrough of this because of that reason. There's no hidden information, at least in the base game, there's no hidden information. So you could do exactly what Red was saying and, and have one person have the game, tilt the camera down and and play through does that still hold true for the expansions is there hidden information in the expansion um no i don't think there's any hidden information the only uh, thing the say, location cards uh no those are instant so those happen immediately oh <laughs> did you play that wrong in the last i time? played that <laughs> wrong <laughs> that's fine that's fine um yeah they they happen instantly so you you might have some that you keep, um, but they are public. Um, and if the rule book doesn't say that, then I'll I'll make sure that. But if but if it's an if it's an action that you're triggering, it's just an opportunity to do it right then, uh, as opposed to an action yeah. that you can save for later. Because some of them are like right. Some of them have the a little yellow lightning bolt, and that means do it now. And some okay. of them have a you can do this whenever you want. Which yeah. you know. this one says keep this card. Yeah. So those are keep the card till the end of the game. And then there's one that has a yellow lightning bolt, and that means do that immediately. Uh, but there are some that you will have that are private information. Um, Michael's got it, yeah. The one that's wild, uh, the, you can use it as a, as a, uh, a wild representation of a Trobot. Right. Um, yeah. you, you don't, you're not required to make that public, correct? Or are you? Uh, yeah. It, well, it, at least it was intended that you would. So if okay. that's not what the rules say, then I'm going to go in there and make sure that they do. Because cool. one of the things that, I mean, it wasn't by accident that there aren't uh, hidden things because we wanted this to be an easy gateway into gaming. And if you're teaching a person how to play a game, especially uh, like uh, Red was saying, he was, uh, I think it was you saying uh, that you taught two people who had never even played board games before or gotten into it that much. Um, yeah. yeah. And so that kind of thing is you don't have to say, you know, I can't tell you what that card says because I'm not supposed to see it. You know, it's just a really relaxed kind of easy way in. So we wanted yeah, to. Yeah, like I said, so the idea of being able, because uh, what got me thinking about this is the friends that I was playing with uh, for my uh, companions demo, uh, they live in another state to me. Um, so, you know, it's one of those where I don't get together with them very often, but they were like, nah, we totally need to play some more of this. And I was like, well, how can I do this? Oh, wait, mm -hmm. there's no reason not to be able to play it over just a webcam. Although, uh, you might need two webcams with the expansions. It starts becoming a table hog. <laughs> uh, <laughs> kind of hard that to see. That just means that. creative camera work. <laughs> um, I agree. So I'm. I'm going to point this out just before I forget. Yep. That last word there just needs an N removed. Ah. <laughs> yeah, uh, you are looking at a prototype. <laughs> yep, yep. 
but I know I'll forget. Like I'll mentally say, "Oh, I need to show later," but now it's documented, and I won't forget. I uh, I make um, I make those kinds of errors constantly. Mike can tell you because we talk on Discord all the time. I mess up every sentence with something, so there's likely a few of those in the prototype, and we'll definitely get those out before they get to print. What is the yeah. English English language is the third hardest, I believe, still on the planet uh, behind Russian. Well, I have that excuse. It's my first language. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's actually I, I have kind of a, a messed up hand, so I have a mess up, a issue with typing that uh, messes that up a bit. But they get we'll catch it before it gets to print. I promise. Sure. <laughs> I believe it. Do our best. Um, yeah. So we talked a bit about uh, this. Can oh, Mike, you want to say something? No? Nope. Okay. I'm good. Um, we talked a little bit about troubles being up uh, digitally um, uh, or not being up digitally. Um, have you, or what are your, Chris, your thoughts on the virtual realm of tabletop gaming? Uh, do you, have you participated in it? Um, not only from a company perspective, from personal perspective, what do you think of it? Right, so I've done it with friends. Uh, I've played games with friends. I've done some play testing um, of friends' games and stuff like that. Uh, I was in one last night, um, and especially with play testing, uh, I enjoy it because um, you know it gets the job done. You get to see the mechanics and stuff like that. Um, and in this year, I mean, uh, man, I'm I'm thankful that we had this choice, right? I mean, if it happened what, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to do this. Um, so I'm very happy that we have this choice and I have not taken advantage of it as much as a lot of people have, um, mostly because uh, I live with uh, Aaron, uh, the other designer, and we, we just play games all the time. So I don't have a need as much as people who have been stuck by themselves or, uh, even with just people that don't play, want to play games all the time. Uh, we play games daily. <laughs> so uh, the need for me to get on to uh, uh, virtual stuff isn't really there. Um, I'm just very lucky that way. And I know that I am. Um, however, uh, like with cons and stuff, um, I tried to get on, I want to say it was, was it Gen Con or Origin? No, it was the Origins. Um, I tried to get into that, um, and I think I watched like a couple of videos, and then I went on about making, I think I was working on dwellings or something like that at the time, and uh, it just didn't, it's not the same, honestly. It, you know, when you go to a dwellings, I mean, when you go to, when you go to a convention, it's like a vacation, even if you're working it, it's still you know, you're somewhere else. It's a totally different experience. Um, I don't think you'll ever capture that virtually, but I mean, I'm thankful that we have that option, especially for people who have never been able to go to uh, conventions. Before I got into the industry, I've only been able to go to local ones. Um, so, uh, you know, people who, and if you don't live in a big city, I live in Houston, uh, but if you don't live in a big city, you might not even have local ones. So, uh, just the idea, I hope we keep the virtual ones for that reason alone. You know, I hope there's always a virtual aspect uh, so that people who aren't as lucky as I am in my situation uh, can all, can enjoy board games. Yeah, like this past weekend, we were all afforded the opportunity to attend Essen, which is the biggest one in the world. Um, right, I've never been to ago. that one. Right, right. But you could. You you, you, you could. Um, that was same thing my first time. too. Yeah. I mean, I, I go to all of them around cool. here, but overseas, I've never been able to go. So that digital platform, that digital option gave me a chance to be there for the first time. Right. Yeah. And I honestly would have participated more in it just because it is Essen and I've always wanted to be uh, involved in Essen and I haven't had a chance, but uh, unfortunately, I had a Kickstarter to get ready. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. I was a little buried into the Kickstarter at that point. So. I feel this year, and some some uh, some of our attendees that are, are here now can attest to this. I think this year is a lot of trial and error. There's been a few, there's been a few that have done it well, and there's been a few that just didn't do it well at all. 
And I think there's a wicked learning curve because we're all new to this whole thing, right? The communication aspect, the virtual aspect. Um, we've all, and I, I guess I'm speaking for myself. I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I entered the board game world for that interaction, for that discussion at the table to be two feet away from somebody and experience a co-op, a backstabber, a worker placement, whatever it is at the table, two feet away and have that like memory to take with us. And then to jump into a virtual world, which personally I got away from video games because of that. I didn't want to be in the virtual world anymore. I liked the story uh, happening at the table with us and then to like revert back to this and then to have a bad experience with it uh, is kind of, I hope doesn't leave a, a, a sour taste in uh, mouths of those that are, are participating. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. I've tried to, uh, I didn't have a bad experience with it. I just didn't get hooked basically, but I am keeping positive that, you know, I know people are trying other things and uh, different ways of doing it and stuff. And I'll definitely try it again, um, especially in the conventions that I can't reach. Um, and when I'm not running a Kickstarter. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I think we're extremely lucky that all of this happened in a time when we can do this. Right, right. You spoke I think to... there's really good, um, it's gonna continue to grow the, um, I don't know if you followed the news of uh, tabletop events which was um, originally uh, owned and run by the same owner as, um, oh my gosh, the uh, uh, game, uh, game Crafter. There you uh, go. The Game Crafter owner, right? And um, they, you know, they were just like, well, now we don't have any events to organize and we're gonna just have to give up this, this thing that we created. And they ended up striking out a deal with uh, Board Game Geek. So, Board Game Geek is not going to let that go, and it's just going to continue to improve that experience and how that goes. I personally have um, just, you know, in my home space and stuff, it's 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 kind of invasive to be, have me as a loud talker shouting at my screen. <laughs> like just earlier, my wife came down to exercise, and I'm like, "Sorry, honey, I'm on, I'm on a call," and um, so people are going to have to work through there's certain behavior patterns and, and, and just space available in your home and things like that that are going to shift in dramatic ways just because of the length of the period of time that we're in this zone where there's no game group. So it's going to continue to refine and get better, I think. It's a really good topic, Michael. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm proud of how the industry has handled 2020 overall. It was a hell of a hurdle to get through. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Mike, you mentioned um, uh, Game Crafter and tabletop events. I run a local convention here in Syracuse and tabletop events is who I used for the badge system. And man, what a what a godsend that is to have something that kind of organizes your events, your badges, your emails, everything in one place. So I'm happy that uh, they're still around, not only for the Game Crafter side of things, but for the tabletop events side of things, too, that make it way Yeah, they, they kept them very separate businesses. So I don't know if it, you know how many people, if you didn't engage with tabletop events, you wouldn't have known that. Um, right. But he, that the entrepreneur that run, you know, he has a bunch of companies. He's just like a super active guy. One of the interesting things coming up about the uh, online events uh, Gen Con had such a good experience with it that they're actually doing something this weekend uh, where they're just trying to get people together for play. Not a Gen Con per se, but it's a Gen Con run event. Same thing with Board Game Geek. Board Game Geek is doing the virtual con and I think three weeks from now or three weekends from now. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, hurts not, yep. it, it hurts not going to BGG Con. That's our con that we love to go to because it's in dallas it's a four and a half hour drive from us so you yeah. know we go there we buy as many games as we can because we have a car and we pop them in there and then we drop Load it up. yeah <laughs> and it's hurt it's hurting not going this year you know we love it i mean that's a big part of the reason that i do gen con and origins is because they're you know a three or four hour oh, drive sweet. away yeah i can only ever buy like two maybe three games at origins depending on box size I mean, not watching for Gen Con, but yeah. I have friends, uh, we usually mobile about two or three carpools worth from Connecticut over to Indiana. 
and I fly because I don't want to do the 14 hour drive. And then I just take all my luggage and stuff it in my friend's van. <laughs> and then I have them come back with like four of the like um, the cool things, ink bags full of my games that he's transporting for me. That's nice. yeah. Always load them up. There's a whole market for that, right? There's the Essen mules that go to Essen with empty luggage and then you pay them to get all your stuff and then they fly back with their luggage packed up with your thing, with your games. That's I haven't done it that far, but I did did uh, take full advantage of my friend's minivan. Nice. That's so, another aspect of uh, BGG Con is uh, Funny Game Games usually has a whole uh, bunch of Essen games that they're retailing at BGG Con as well. Right. They do that at Origins too, I believe, or someone does the Essen release, or not Origins, sorry, uh, PAX, PAX uh, Unplugged. That's where we got Sagrada, actually, was at BGG Con. Sagrada, you say? Yeah. <laughs> Never I got heard my of Sagrada it. at PAX in the Texas. PAX yeah, South. Sagrada's fantastic. Chris was not opening the floodgates there at all. <laughs> Ooh, well Ooh. done, Mike. Cause of trouble. Um, yeah, little little product plug there. Um, so the uh, last thing on my list, and I, I, we've been here for a while, so I thank you for uh, sticking around. Um, yeah. This has been uh, personally fantastic because I get to talk to the designer of one of my favorite games. Um, but then we get to give this to the world. Um, one of the what? One of the designers. One of the designers. One of the designers, right, right. Erin, uh, Erin could pop on. Um, I, I take up a lot of camera space, um, and uh, she just prefers not to be on there, but I also like to iterate every time that, you know, uh, just because she's not here in front of the camera doesn't mean she didn't. <laughs> uh, in fact, for the expansion, she's chiefly the designer for those. So uh, just a shout out to her, uh, even though she doesn't want me to. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the last thing on my list was about the future of conventions. And we kind of talked about the virtual, we kind of talked about that need to be at the table, um, and the desire to be in person with people again, um, which might not happen, uh, by the time the con season starts in the beginning of 2021. How do you see the future of conventions, in-person conventions? Uh, happening in the near future or not so distant future? Well, I mean, I, I'm not an authority on conventions and stuff. I'm, I'm mainly a goer and then, uh, you know, I'll participate anytime uh, someone will let me so that I can go. Um, but, uh, you know, the hope, everybody's hope is that we can start doing it safely again, but who knows when that's going to be. And, uh, you know, like I said, it, it really kind of hurts that we can't go to BGG Con. It's something we look forward to every single year. Um, and so when it gets back around, I don't usually hit a convention. I, we have a local convention that I know has already been canceled. That's like in January um, or February, I think. And um, we know, I know I won't get that. And then I don't usually hit a convention until Gen Con. Um, so you know, if we don't have Gen Con going on there, uh, that's going to be a sad feeling that I know everybody has been feeling uh, who goes to conventions. So uh, my hope is that we just get to them as soon as possible, but again, as safely as possible. It's in the end, it's a fun hobby and there's no reason to risk, uh, you know, uh, sickness. I myself am uh, susceptible to, uh, uh, lung issues. So I've been extremely careful. Um, luckily, I work from home uh, with Breaking Games. Uh, they've afforded me that opportunity. So um, I, I basically just live inside my little bubble and have been safe that way. So for me, even if they start conventions, if I feel like it's a little early, I probably won't go, you know, uh, and that's unfortunate. But so one of the questions I asked uh, other guests is the ramp up right to the Gen Con uh, with the 72,000 people in one uh, event hall or exhibitor hall. And do you think that that's really feasible for next year? Or do you think your local conventions that you can afford to go to that are, because they're within driving distance will actually be the next big thing kind of 
so my okay. local convention, uh, the one that got canceled that's in February, um, that one is only, I think, I want to say maybe 1,200 people, something like that. So very small, meets at a university, Rice University. Um, and uh, I would have thought that if something like that was going to happen, the, the smaller ones would happen first, right? Um, because you're right, with 75,000 people, you can't. There's no controlling it. You're going to have an outbreak, right? Um, nobody's that careful. <laughs> um, I wouldn't be able to go if that was the case, you know. Um, right. So uh, I guess you're right that local ones will start happening first. And uh, if that's the case, you can probably be a little more careful. Um, yeah, I don't know what I can answer to that, but that, that would be my hope that, you know, we at least start off small. And then in the end, I guess, uh, like what's the, what's the break? At what point do we say, okay, 75,000 people is fine again. You know? Right. Right. So uh, do we need uh, actual medicine, a cure or something like that? You know, a vaccine? I don't know. We just got to yeah, have like a vaccine in mist to walk through. <clears throat> what was that, Mike? Well, the something like what michael was just saying like you know if it, if you walk through a mist or you know the affordability of you know of course mas masks are a thing right you know social right. distancing is what you just can't do in a space like gen con right but um but what can you do and what how expensive is that going to be you know in terms of what tools are needed and you know medicines or physical masks like things whatever um, right and it's or, Oh, sorry, go ahead. And then the insurance, you know, the the whole insurance thing and, you know, will people be able to blame the event organizers? You know, they told me I would be safe. And blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I hadn't even really thought about that. It, maybe that's why the local ones will have to wait too because they might not be able to afford that kind of insurance. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, and as far as like missing real cons, you know, uh, uh, I'm an introvert. Um, and so it, I don't think it hurts as much. Mike, as an extrovert, can tell you. Um, I don't think it hurts introverts as much, but I think it does, um, and we just don't feel it. Uh, like, in the end, uh, introvert, uh, I'm, I'm starting to really feel it with BGGCon because I realize because I work at home and I'm an introvert, uh, I can't even go to Starbucks and just talk to the baristas anymore. Um, I'm... I'm feeling very, uh, what's like when introverts start feeling like they need to socialize, you know, <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. been a while. Um, sure. So I, I think it hurts all human beings on the same level. It's just introverts don't feel it as harshly or as soon as extroverts do. So right. I really do hope we get there, you know, get back to it soon. One of the hurdles, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, or maybe it wasn't on, on this, but um, the design curriculum that I, um, I was doing with a colleague in high school with the 10th graders, um, when this year hit and you had the opportunity to be like partially remote and come in once a week or fully remote, um, the hurdle was how do we even get them to play a game where they can't share a pen, right? If you touch a pen, I can't touch that pen now. That pen has to be thrown out. Um, how do you play with a deck of cards or with meeples or with things that are at the table that you're touching? And that, I think, the ability to wear a mask, which also is advertising real estate, right? Um, to be social distance, to be able to, to make sure that you're healthy and wash your hands while you're at a place is one thing. But being able to socially interact with a game that you're there for, right? To be able to touch the same components or the same game board, um, that's that I think is the bigger thing. Yeah, it's a weird thing because I think the the explosion of the industry since what, 2013, 2013 something like that, uh, right. probably even before, I guess, but the, the slow ramp up of the industry, I think is because everybody had gotten so used to their mobile devices and kind of separation that whenever games are put in front of you and you got to socialize personally, um, it was like, oh yeah, I remember this kind of thing. And it, it's why the industry was getting big and suddenly we're told can't do that. And it just kind of, it hurts um, the, 
I, I think it hurts that drive that everybody was getting from socializing um, mm-hmm. in person. And like I said, I'm very uh, impressed with the industry as far as going virtual um, so quickly. Like, uh, I don't know if uh, we would have been able to do it even just a couple of years beforehand, but it just felt like instantly everybody went, okay, virtual and tried their best to, uh, maybe not everybody was successful, but I mean, just to turn on a dime and try to, what can we do? Even breaking games, we were having meetings like, what can we do? We put a Sparkle Kitty uh, up there uh, as a- a Sparkle Kingdom. Kingdoms, yeah, thank you. Sparkle Kingdom, uh, playing that virtually and stuff like that. I mean, you know, for a industry that takes months, maybe a year to put a game on a table, uh, from start to finish, maybe even more, uh, just to turn that quickly, uh, based on what's happened, uh, I was pretty impressed. And what, what a, what a, when you talk about a Venn diagram, right? You have the virtual world and you have the tabletop gaming world and that cross right in the middle is iteration and put up a, put up a virtual convention. All right, that didn't work. Let's do it again. Let's try something different or what didn't work. What did work? Let's go with it. And how, how amazing that speaks so well to game design, right? Yeah. It, and I really like the positive attitudes that I've seen for the most part that have been like, okay, that didn't work, but let's try this mm-hmm. one. Let's just, you know, it, it's not just a, oh, this isn't working and it all shut down and nobody's trying anything, you know? Right. Right. Cool. Um, all right. That's, that's my list. A uh, very short list at that. Um, do uh red or or holly do you have any questions for chris mike i'm sure you have tons of questions um mike gets access to me all the time sure sure (laughs) most of the good most of the questions were answered i just can't wait to try this expansion that i got today pretty exciting great yeah let us know uh how you uh enjoyed it and tell us which uh companions you ended up getting to I was like hearing which ones you had to I do. I want to use little Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> so Holly, I feel at some point when you're done with your expansion and I'm done with my expansion, we should just trade expansions. Flip flop. So, okay, I mean, I've already, you know, volunteered to send mine out as soon as someone has, you know, that someone needs it, and, you know, potentially get troublemakers. Oh, so Red, you need troublemakers? I do. I have companions. All right, so whichever one of you is, is fully through your uh, gameplay uh, play testing um, I, have, I literally just opened mine, so if you're already <laughs> done, Red, that's okay. I don't know who else I would swap with, though. I don't know who else has a copy. Yeah, we'll figure that out. Pat, Pat let us know that he, uh, he could switch off, and so I was waiting for someone else to have it so we could switch between the two. So whenever you guys are ready, uh, we'll, we'll orchestrate that for you. Yeah, we have all the contact info, so you can just you can just get us up on uh, Discord. Yeah, we're on file. <laughs> have Frenchies. our names. Um. All right. So, asking for troubles, troublemakers, companions on Kickstarter till November nineteenth. Um. If you haven't seen the game, play the game. It's fantastic. Um. Chris, I want to thank you for your time. Mike, I want to thank you for your time. Holly and Red, I'm sure I'll be talking to you at some point outside of this uh, mic as well. I don't know you. Yeah, I know, right? (laughs) Thank Um, you very much for uh, having me and for, you know, giving me this great opportunity to hang out with Chris again and Mike. Yeah, they're pretty good. Pretty good people. Oh, uh, and one more thing. Uh, The the campaign itself, if we didn't mention, I'm pretty sure we mentioned it, but the campaign itself if you go to the page, there's something that says share this. Um, we are adding companions. And right now we are asking for people to retweet a post that if you click on it, uh, we have five retweets on there, five more and we'll get that guy. Uh, y is his name. And uh, he'll be added and then a new one will pop up shortly after him. Mm. All right, so I think, I think we need to go do that right now. Go. <laughs> I don't have a Twitter. I'll have to make a Twitter. You have friends, don't you? I mean, I have friends. 
we're and bouncing okay. between Twitter and Facebook. We'll do an Instagram one too. So we're trying to hit all the platforms. The one before this I was have Facebook, Facebook, Instagram. I have you all day on those socials. So funny story. Uh, I already had Facebook posts up uh, prior to you know all of this, but while we were on this, I already put up my uh, Instagram and Twitter posts. Mm-hmm. Awesome. <laughs> that teamwork efficient. I like it. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks again. I really appreciate you taking the time. This was fantastic uh, from a personal level, but I'm sure everyone else, hopefully they got something from it um, and enjoyed their time watching us uh, babble about board games and cardboard. Yeah. Uh, what else is there to talk about? Right. <laughs> well, I'm sure we can come up with a couple <laughs> things. <laughs> That's for another stream. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Cool. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching or tuning in or watching this however you watched it uh thank you to our guest chris our special guests uh panels uh people that stopped in people that left that weren't cool enough to stay the whole time uh you should have been here it was it was fun but now you're watching it uh in a future iteration so enjoy um we'll talk soon a little from the past right right thanks michael you're awesome adios Take care, guys. Have a great day. Stay safe. See you soon.